okay, Math 43, let's put that empirical rule to use. I'm gonna read example nine, and I want you to be on the listen for what is the variable in this problem. So in a study investigating the effect of car speed on accident severity, 5,000 reports of fatal automobile accidents were examined, and the vehicle speed and impact was recorded for each one. It was determined that the average speed was 42 miles per hour, and that the standard deviation was 15 miles per hour. In addition, a histogram revealed that, a, that vehicle speed and impact could be described by a normal curve. All right, so we have a whole bunch of words in there that I'm hoping kind of stand out to us, but I do wanna go back and answer that initial question. What was the variable in this problem? So if we think about the variable in this problem, if you're not sure what it is, like if you can't pick it out, no problem, but look at the units they gave you. You see this miles per hour, right? Every numerical variable has units. So we're talking about some kind of speed and they're talking about vehicle speed at impact, right? So that is our variable in this problem. So let me just write that down. So our variable is vehicle speed, vehicle, oops, I can't spell vehicle this morning. All right, so there's our numerical variable, and the units are miles per hour, because like always, every numerical variable has some kind of units. So let's think about this, it's numerical. Is this continuous numerical, or is it discrete numerical? And when we think about speed, do we measure speed or do we count speed? And I think you'd agree we measure speed, right? You have a little speedometer on your car, and then that, that gauge goes like this, you know, it's you hit every speed between zero and 60. You don't just jump zero, 10, 20. Every speed is hit along the way. All of those possible values play out over an interval. So we've got vehicle speed for our variable. We know it's continuous numerical. And there's some other buzzwords I want us to see, right? We have that the average speed was 42 miles per hour, that the standard deviation was 15 miles per hour. And then this key phrase here, that the vehicle speeds could be described by a normal distribution. So believe it or not, just with those three pieces of information, we pretty much have our socks and we have a special notation for that. So we would say X, our variable, right? Vehicle speeds and impact are distributed normally. So we know we have the bell curve for our shape. We know the mean is 42 miles per hour and the standard deviation is 15 miles per hour, right? So we are given those pieces of information. And in terms of that trait table I gave you, right? As soon as you see normal curve, you know you're either on the standard normal distribution on that front page or on just any regular old normal distribution on the back page. So let's talk about how you could distinguish. Am I on the standard normal or am I on the regular normal? Well, let's look at what was given for the mean, right? In the standard normal distribution, you're always dealing with z-scores. The mean is always zero, and the standard deviation is always one. Well, let's look at what information we were given. We were on the normal curve, but you'll see that our mean was not zero. All right, so we can immediately rule out our being on the standard normal distribution. And then we know that for this problem, we're on any regular old normal distribution, and we're gonna be following the rules in here. And you see, I said, the, for any normal distribution, the mean will always be given. The standard deviation will always be given, right? We were given 42 miles an hour and 15 miles an hour, and we know the shape has got the bell curve, all right? And so for the, the graph, we're, we're gonna scale our x-axis in just a moment, but, but that's, that's what we got going on for right now. All right, so with that, let's see what this says. This says roughly what proportion of vehicle speeds were between 27 and 57 miles per hour. Sketch a graph of this situation and shade the area of interest on the PDF. So before we get into really breaking this down, I, I do want to label and scale our, our axes. So your variable always goes along the x-axis. So we've got speed down here in miles per hour. Okay, I'm going to label this x. Now, the number below the peak is always the average, so it is 42 miles per hour. And things are gonna get a little cramped here because I don't have a ton of room. And then let's start scaling our x-axis. 
we know that basically any x-axis for a normal distribution involves going three deviations above the mean and three deviations below. Right? There's that range of about six standard deviations. So let's start scaling this. All right, so I'm going to start with 42 and I'm going to add 15 to it. So I'm looking at 57. And I'll just approximate. That's about one deviation over the mean. Let me add another 15 and we're at 72. Let me add yet another 15 and we are at 87. And yet you don't always have to scale it three up and three back, but especially for this first example, I just I want to, just so we can see what that would look like. 42 minus 15, if I go the other way, it looks like this was 27. Let me lose another 15, we're down to 12. And let me lose another 15 and we are down to negative three. All right, and you can see that there, there's no way for a vehicle speed to be negative three miles per hour. And this is where theory kind of runs itself into um, the real world. So theoretically, this would go down to negative three, but in the real world, you, you don't have vehicle speeds of negative three. So like I said, the, the real world is always messy, right? So we're just talking, in theory, this is our bell curve, even though we can recognize that that actually isn't possible. So we've got our x-axis, it's labeled, it's scaled. Let's label our y-axis, probabilities always go up here. And again, we don't have enough calculus to figure out how to scale these numbers, and that's totally fine. I don't want you to worry about that. All right, so let's go back to the, the question. Roughly what proportion of vehicle speeds were between 27 and 57 miles per hour? All right, when you hear proportion, that's one of those P words, right? We've got probability, proportion, percentage. When we get to chapter nine, we'll hear P value. But let's put capital P with some stuff in the parentheses. All right, so I want vehicle speeds between 27 and 57. All right, vehicle speeds is my variable. So I wanna do 27 to 57. Okay. And if you remember from about two examples ago, it doesn't matter if you have the less than or the less than or equal to symbol. Because some folks might say, well, how did I, why are you putting less than or equal to? Why not less than? It doesn't matter because the equals to picks up no area under the curve. All right, we saw that when we were calculating probabilities of z-scores. So these symbols in continuous land don't make any difference. Whereas in chapter four in discrete land, they made a ton of difference. All right, so with that, let's see if we can shade the area of interest. I'm gonna start in the middle here, or start inside my parentheses. I wanna go x between 27 and 57. So I can spot them on my x-axis. So let me make some little vertical marks and we will shade the area of interest. So I want 27 to 57. Okay. So I would like to figure out what proportion of area under the curve is my shaded region. Because area under your bell curve is probability when we're in continuous land. All right, so let me keep shading this. Right? So we got that now. What proportion is that? Well, if I look at it, it looks like it's more than half, right? To me, that looks like 60, 70 percent, somewhere in there. And if we go back to the empirical rule, right, we had, we had some information about this because these two numbers are impo or they're important and they're specific, right? 27 happened to be one deviation below the mean, right? That has a z-score of negative one. 57 was exactly one deviation above the mean, which would have had a z-score of positive one. All right. So if I'm going from z-scores of negative one to positive one, or one deviation below the mean to one deviation above, right? we had that empirical rule that said 68% of our observations are within a deviation of the mean, 34 on each side. So let me just remind us what this graph could look like. Okay. I could split this in half and say this was 34% and this was 34%, but really from the empirical rule, I'm getting that about 68% of vehicle speeds were between 27 miles an hour and 57 miles an hour. So I'm gonna put 0.68 here for my answer, okay? So the empirical rule says that about 68% of observations are within a deviation of the mean. And in the context of this question, it means about 68% of vehicle speeds 
when we were talking about fatal automobile accidents, about 68% of those speeds were somewhere between 27 and 57 miles an hour. Okay. All right, so with that, let me scoot this up. Let's see if we can get the next graph in there. Yeah, all right, so that's looking good. Okay, so this is roughly what proportion of vehicle speeds exceed 57 miles an hour. Sketch a graph, shade the area. All right, so let me go ahead and label and scale my x-axis again. Just with this symbol, x is approximately normal. Oops, let me see if you can see that. Let me drag this down just a bit. So with this symbol, x is approximately normal with a center of 42 and a standard deviation of 15. I can scale and label my x-axis. So we've got speed for our variable, our units are miles an hour. This is the x-axis. I know 42 is under the peak. Now up here, I went and I scaled this three above, or three deviations above the mean, three deviations below. I'm going to be a little bit more efficient and just do the center and then this 57. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just do those two in this example. You can do more if you want. If you wanted to tack on 27 here, no problem. Okay. So then I'm going to put probability, that's always along the y's. Right? We've always had relative frequencies along the y-axis. All right, so I want the proportion that exceed. So I'm going to have P with some stuff in parentheses. All right, vehicle speeds exceed 57. So you need to take that English phrase and turn it into some math. Vehicle speeds is our variable. Exceeds would be greater than. And then I'm looking at greater than 57. Okay. So let's start inside the parentheses. So x greater than 57. Let's go to 57 on our x-axis. And if I exceed, I would like to shade to the right here. And so I would like that proportion. And again, keeping in mind, if the total area under this bell curve is 1, that to me looks like 20%. Right? It's definitely less than 50%. It's not as much as this area. But how can we start to piece this together? Well, I want us to refer back to, to part A. So this was right the middle 68% of my data. Now, I intentionally put 57 here and 57 here so we could start to use both of these graphs to see what we, we need. So I think you'll agree that this area right here to the right of 57 is the same as this area. I shaded the middle part because part A was asking about the middle. Here I want the stuff that's larger than 57. So I want you to see this, this unshaded white part of the graph is, is the same area as the shaded grayed out part of, of this graph. All right, so let's refer to this. If this is the middle 68%, and I want you to think this whole area under the curve has to be 100%. If we knew where the middle 68% is, we could figure out what was unshaded in this problem. We can use the complement rule. So if I take 100% and I lose 68, I would have 32%, right? So between these two outside parts, the, the stuff, the speeds that are less than 27 and greater than 57, I know there's 32% of my data. And through symmetry, these two areas have to be the same. So when I divide this by two, I find out that there's actually 16% on a side. So while this is the middle 68, this is 16%, and this is also 16%. But that offers up the answer to this question, right? What proportion of vehicle speeds exceeded 57 miles per hour? Well, it was 16%. Another way of looking at this, if I pull back over that bell curve from the previous page, all right, when you are one deviation above the mean, which we were, right? The mean was 42 miles an hour. One deviation above the mean was 57 miles an hour. We talked about how this is the 84th percentile, which in the context of the question we're working on, it means 84% of vehicle speeds were 57 miles an hour or less. Right? It was the 84th percentile. But if you have the bottom 84%, that's also the cutoff for the top 16%. Right? Because if I do 100 minus 84, I have 16% to the right. So we can use percentiles here to think about, well, bottom 84% is 
it is the 84th percentile, but it's also the cutoff for the top 16 percent. Okay. All right, so let's try a couple of multiple choice questions, see how we're doing with this. So I'm going to scooch this up. Okay. All right, so with example 10, I want you to be on the list and like always, what is the variable in this problem? We always want to figure out what is our variable. So in a certain southwest city, the air pollution index averages 62.5 during the year with the standard of 18, excuse me, standard deviation of 18. Assuming the empirical rule is appropriate, the index falls within what interval 95% of the time? All right, so if you can't spot your variable, no problem just yet. I want us to be on the listen though for some important words. I hope average popped out, right? And I hope standard deviation popped out and that empirical rule popped out. Okay. Now our variable here was air pollution. So our air pollution index. So we had our variable was air pollution index. And we were also given some important information. We were given the center, we were given the average, we were given the standard deviation, and this empirical rule is telling us that, hey, we are working with the bell curve here. So I can say air pollution indexes or indices are approximately normal. Their average is 62.5 and their standard deviation is 18. So with that information, let me go scale and label the x-axis here. All right, so I have x down here. I'm gonna label this with air pollution or air pollution index. Now there were no units here because I, I couldn't find units when I was talking about air pollution indices. Uh, if you can find them, let me know. I'd love to know what the units are. But here we go, 62.5. And I'm going to just, for practice sake, I'm going to go three up and three back in terms of the deviations, just so we can practice that. It's going to get a little cramped, so let me make my marks. So one, two, three, and then we'll go one, two, three. All right, so let's do 62.5 plus 18, and we're looking at 80.5, and then let me add another 18. We're at 98.5, and another 18 gets us to, ooh, 116.5. I mean, I don't know about air pollution indices. That just sounds like it's polluted. So 62.5 minus 18, we got 44.5. If I lose another 18, we've got 26.5. And if I lose yet another 18, I've got 8.5. Okay, so I've got all of that, and let's, let's see what the question is asking. It says, assuming the empirical rule is appropriate, we have assumed that, the index falls within what interval 95% of the time? All right, so we gotta go 95%. If we go back to the empirical rule, right, we knew that if we wanted 95%, Right, it's the 68, 95, 99, 7. I need to go two standard deviations in either direction. Right, I got to go two up, two back. So let's go two standard deviations up and two standard deviations back. If I go two up and two back, all right, here we go. There's the mean. Let me go one, two. I'm here. And then from here, let me go down one, two, right here. And I'll shade that area. Oh, and just take a note. Even though there's a multiple choice question, I notice I didn't label my y-axis. So let me put probability there. And then let me shade this. All right. And we know this would be about 95% of the area under the curve. That's what the empirical rule is telling us. Probably could have done a little bit better job shading. <laughs> Okay, so we've got, that's the middle 95% of my data. Right, and what were our cutoffs? It looks like they were 26.5 and 98.5. So my answer here is B. Now, let's talk about the other options just so we're aware of it. If you see this was 8.5 to 116.5, that was three below, three deviations below to three deviations above. A would have been the answer if this question had said 99.7%. Okay, so if this is a 99.7%, then I needed to go three below to three above, and A would have been my answer. And I think you can see on part C, right, this is one below to one above. 
So if this had said 68%, then C would have been my answer. And D is just some nonsense, okay? All right, so let's take a look at example 11. So example 11 says, consider a normal distribution. All right, so I'm gonna make sure I take note of that. Normal distribution, it says frog weights. There's the mean, here's the standard deviation. So consider a normal distribution of frog weights with the mean of 500 grams and a standard deviation of 65 grams. Assume a sample, or not assume, a sample size of 2,000 is drawn from this population. Approximately how many cases would you expect to find between 435 and 565? All right, so let's, let's figure this out. I'm gonna go ahead and label and scale my axes and see what information pops up from there. All right, let me scooch this up just so we can see my axes as we get through this. All right, so here we go. So the variable here was frog weights and the units were grams, all right? So let me go ahead and say my variable here was frog weights. Those were grams, now again, Weight is numerical. It's continuous numerical because we measure your weight. We don't count it. We can report it discreetly, but it's definitely continuous numerical. And on top of that, they told us our graph is approximately normal for its shape. Center was 500. Standard deviation was 65. That's all the information I need to scale and label my axes. So let's go do this. So I'm going to put probability on the Y. I'm not going to forget this time. Let's go to X on the X, so I've got 500 below the peak. And let me try one above and one below. So when I say one above and one below, let's go to a z-score of one and a z-score of negative one. So I'm gonna add a deviation to the mean. So that would be 565. Well, that's a nice number because that was in my problem. Let me subtract a deviation and get 435. All right, and that's nice that that popped up. That's another number in my problem. So I'm not even gonna scale my axes any more than that. Those are the numbers I am looking for. All right, so we've got that one deviation above, one deviation below. All right, and we know from the empirical rule that if I go one deviation above to one deviation below, I've got 68% of my data or 68% of my observations. So I know the probability that frog weights going between 435 and 565 was 68%. Okay. And again, it doesn't matter if you have less than versus less than or equal to. But this wasn't asking me for a probability. This was saying how many, right? So you see the how many, they're saying I want a frequency. This is a relative frequency. And if we go back to chapter one, whenever you wanna go from relative frequency back to frequency, multiply by the sample size. All right, we always did it there in chapter one where if we went from, wanted to go from frequency to relative frequency, we would divide by sample size. So if you wanna go backwards, multiply by sample size. So I have 2,000 frogs, 68% of whom are within this, these two weights. Let's figure out about how many frogs that is. So we'll go 2,000 times 0.68, and that's about 1,360 frogs. All right, boom, there we go. All right, so with that, we're gonna flip to the next and, and last example, and what we're gonna start to talk about is, how do we get these probabilities when numbers don't land on integer values of deviations. So what I mean by that, this was a z-score of negative one, z-score of zero, z-score of one. They were integer values of deviations. What happens if instead of 565, what if this was 530? Right? What if it didn't fall on a nice z-score? How do I find that area under the curve? And we're gonna use our calculator for that. All right, I'll see you in a bit, bye.